I want to agree with, um, with Ambassador Eisenstadt. The Chinese really do not have any prejudices. In fact, they have a Jewish community for a long time. And there's a story, of course, about the Jew from Brooklyn who finds himself, himself in Shanghai on a Friday night. And he's desperate to find a shul. He does. He walks in, feels just like at home, except everybody's Chinese. And afterwards, he goes up to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, I just want to tell you how happy I am that I found you and that you took me in. And I'm, it feels just like at home in Brooklyn. And the rabbi looks at him and says, are you Jewish? <laughs> he, says, uh, he says, of course I am. Funny you don't look Jewish. <laughs> now, you've heard the, the introduction. Or the way our question was formulated was quite ap ap apocalyptic about tempests and about global warming and collapse and so on. I would like to kind of uh, do the counterpoint today, like in a fugue by Bach, and tell you it can be a lot worse. It was a lot worse. Let's start with two world, war, two world wars that killed 70 million people, almost destroyed Europe. Think about the nuclear apocalypse that hung over our heads in the 50s and 60s and 70s, especially during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Think in this area about the Yom Kippur War, Kippur War, which was really a very serious existential threat to Israel for about the first two weeks, and about the, the Soviet Union and the Americans rattling their nuclear swords. That was serious stuff. Now, and compared to the Great Depression, of course, the current economic financial crisis is a tempest in a teacup. Let me give you the influenza pandemic of 1918, which killed more people than World War I. Think about real bad stuff, the twin scourge of Bolshevism and Nazism in the 20th century. And it isn't even clear that, that, um, that it is warming, global, that the world is warming, since the average global temperatures have remained constant for the last 15 years. And strategically speaking, there's no rapacious um, great power lurking on the horizon that would threaten the entire planet. Iran is nasty and dangerous, but it is not in a category with Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, or Soviet Russia. Um, we talked about the pandemic of influenza of 1918. Compared to that, the mad cow and SARS diseases do not really count very much. Longevity keeps rising. Various end of the world scenarios like the Club of Rome's 40 years ago on the exhaustion of carbon energy have disappeared. And instead, we are looking, as Stu Eisen said, instead, on, at another oil and glut of oil, on the gas and oil market. Um, by the way, crime, rate and crime rates in the West are coming down since the 90s, especially in the United States. Another good piece of news. And if you look at this country, you know, you know, Jews, of course, are always supposed to worry. But, um, and there's good reason why they're worried. Um, this, if you look at this country, which has leapfrogged um, you know, maybe a century of economic development by going straight from orange, orange peels to microchips, in one generation, and which has defeated every single Arab assault, that's also kind of good news. Even terror, terror in this country has dwindled to almost zero. Uh, and if you really, just let me end this list, because I could go on, but if you really want to know how, we are li how our lives have improved compared to the past, the, those, of, those of you a bit older, think about what it was like to go to the dentist and have your teeth drilled without local anesthetic. That gives you a sense of how our lives have been improved. Yes, you'll say there is, of course, there is Al-Qaeda, but don't forget a critical thing about Al-Qaeda. International terror kills, but it does not pose a strategic threat. That is important to remember. It is, 
terrorism is nasty, mean, and moral to the max, but it's not a strategic threat to us. And I'm going to pick up uh, on Stuart Eisenstein here. There is the clash of civilizations, and of course, as Sam Huntington correctly put it, Islam has bloody borders, which is true, but I am more impressed by Islam not as a, uh, as a civilization of clashes. The issue is inside. As we heard, mil mil Muslims kill each other by the millions, and the bloodiest war in the Middle East, of course, was fought between Iran and <clears throat> Iraq, two Muslim powers. So let me go from here and generalize a little bit. What are the issues? What are the threats? I just told you what the, th what the threats are not and how certain things have improved. What are the threats? I think um, the most serious threat in this 21st century comes from the inside, from the inside of failing or failed states. Um, from Africa to Afghanistan. Uh, this is what is, what, is, what is preoccupying us day by day and will not stop. Uh, on the other hand, um, there is good news, quote unquote, in, uh, as these conflicts do not threaten global stability. On the other hand, there's bad news because, of course, these domestic conflicts, these civil wars, of course, can, can spill over, which we are witnessing right now, the best, or actually the worst example being Syria, which has dragged, is dragging, has dragged in outside powers, great and small, via proxy forces, for instance, and threatens to provoke direct confrontation. I have no hope for Syria, but I hope fervently that all the state actors that are now extending their hands remember in 2013 the Balkans of 1913, the year before uh, the Great War broke out. Let us now look on the global scale. I think the good news there is that the competition between the reigning superpower and the Chinese challenger is encased and restrained in so many constraints and dependencies which suggest that there won't be a remake of what normally happens when a rising power challenges the sitting power, like the German Empire challenged Britain or the Japanese in the 20th century challenged the United States, which triggered massive, if not, if not global war. I don't think that is threatening here. Um, 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 because there's many dependencies, be it trade and strategic and financial, um, that are tying those two together. Um, the not so good news, I think, is that Russia is back. Imperial Russia is back. Um, after 20 years of licking its wounds and consolidating, Russia now plays, for people like me who teach international politics, it's, Russia is wonderful. It tells me the 19th century is back. Great power politics is back. Russia is doing exactly what we teach them in diplomatic history. It's sending, dispatching a navy to the eastern Mediterranean. It is giving state-of-the-art state uh, uh, anti-air and anti-ship weapons to the Syrians. It is challenging and cahoots with Hezbollah and with, with Syria, uh, with, with Iran, the United States as the reigning power in the Middle East. Great stuff when you teach international politics. But uh, so that's something, so that's not so good news. The also not so good news comes from Obama's America because what is happening here, here's the greatest power on earth proposing something that great powers have never done. It is proposing to contain and neutralize itself. It is balancing against itself, so to speak. The United States was leading from behind in Libya and leading not at all in Syria. Um, and it is 
Instead, nation building at home, to use an Obama phrase, hence retraction and self-weakening, something, as I said, great powers have never done to themselves before unless they were forced to do so by greater powers. And so my worry is, is what we might face is creeping anarchy, softly, softly. For the first time since World War II, and World War II is now 70 years back, uh, which has been an enormous period of strategic stability, for the first time since World War II, the housekeeper of the world, the US, seems resigned to resigning. There's a saying in German, which maybe even works in English, when the cat is out of the house, the mice start dancing. You get it? Is there something like that in Hebrew? Hachatul, minabait, or something? Um, so, when, so the Russia, as I said, has splashed the feet to the eastern Mediterranean while the Iran is playing the US for a patsy in the nuclear negotiations as in the minuet, bow, circle, return to the starting point. So both Putin and Khamenei have taken the measure of Obama's America and they have concluded that opportunity beckons. So after the complete withdrawal from the greater Middle East, civil war will, has resumed in Iraq, will resume in Afghanistan, and um, apart from rearming at double-digit speed, China is testing the US in the Pacific, where it threatens Japan, a US ally, and so on. This is the oldest game in the, in the, in the, in the game of, of nations. Um, I want to conclude. Um, I started out by, by painting a more benign, friendly world than what you read in the daily papers. But in geostrategic terms, it is, the world is becoming not more dangerous, but more labile. Um, um, with nobody in sight who would take on America's role if America continues to retract, what are we going to do about this world? What is going to happen to this world if nobody is in charge, if there is no housekeeper anymore? That is the crucial question. But as I, at this point, I will act like the United States, like Obama's United States, I would retract and contain myself. But we have a bunch of very, very smart people on the table who will have all the right answers. Thank you.